welcome back to uh, my channel Workshop Friend and uh, this is part four of making a homemade lathe. Today I'm standing outside of one of the pumping stations for Isambard Kingdom Brunel's Atmospheric Railway here at Star Cross near Exeter, Devon. This was an innovative uh, solution to uh, providing a locomotive power um, and instead of a locomotive there was actually a, a system whereby uh, um, the carriages were propelled along the track by a piston in um, a 22 inch diameter pipe running the whole length of the railway. And uh, this was thought to be a, a good solution to uh, steep gradients which was a problem on this track and also a way of providing clean power uh, by keeping um, the dirty steam engines which operated these pumps away from the passengers. So these uh, pumping stations were situated every three, mile, three miles along the track. Uh, wait till the end of the video to hear um, what the outcome of this um, innovative design was and uh, maybe we can uh, learn some lessons from that. In today's video I'm going to be uh, focusing on design principles for building a homemade lathe and um, this may not suit everyone um, but I think it's sometimes good before you just uh, launch out on a project and go straight into the workshop and make things to stop and think and plan and the object of this uh, uh, video is to encourage you to do that and to um, ensure that your project has the best chance of being successful. So if you enjoy this video uh, do give me a thumbs up and consider subscribing to this video if you like to receive more similar content. Thank you. It's a good idea to stand back and take an overall view of the project and uh, by going through this process I think you stand a greater chance of being successful. The first consideration in my list of 10 items is to answer the question why you want to make a lathe. There could be a number of reasons and the, the first and probably the most common is just for the fun of it, just the experience and that's a good enough reason, as good a reason as any. Another reason could be to acquire new skills, uh, particularly if you're a young person or new to uh, this hobby then uh, it's a good project to learn new skills. It could be that uh, you actually have skills already but you want a machine to use and uh, this might be a solution for you to acquire a machine which otherwise might be too expensive. It could be any combination of the above but it's important to establish clearly why you want to undertake this project. The next thing to do is to come up with a technical specification and in order to do that you need to understand and know already why you want to make the project. So with, armed with that information you should be able to um, know what purpose the lathe is going to be for. Is it for general, um, small, small machining? Could it be the starting point uh, for your workshop, the first machine tool that you acquire by making it yourself? Could it be for clock making or model engineering? Is it for something um, particular like ornamental turning? There are a number of possibilities. The next thing is to determine the center height. What's the largest diameter of work that you anticipate uh, 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 requiring to um, hold in the machine? Uh, what's the distance between centers? Um, what kind of material are you planning to turn? Um, there are a number of possibilities. It could be ferrous materials. It could be plastics. It could be wood. It could even be something unusual like marble. And the speed range. So um, by now you should know what kind of speed range you require and that will give you an idea later on of the drive that you require. And then you come to the question of budget. Uh, how much money you are going to spend. And to answer that question properly, again, you need to refer to why you're making the lathe. And now you're also armed with information about the technical specification. So take into account, um, as best you can, the cost of raw materials, the cost of bought in parts, um, the cost of getting parts made, and the cost of equipment that you will need to acquire in order to undertake this project. 
Now, some of this equipment might be the basis of a future workshop, in which case it's not just an expenditure for the lathe, it's for other purposes as well. But factor that in. What accessories do you need to purchase? I mean, you, you're probably not going to be making a chuck, so you need to uh, factor that in and other tooling too. Are you going to require a stand? Do you need to make that or is this lathe going to be bench mounted? If uh, you don't have an overall budget or can't work out an overall, overall budget, then it might be a good idea to um, say how much money can I afford to spend per month on this over the projected build period? Um, how much can you continue to put into this over a period of time? And another very important question, how much should you be putting into this? Once you've come up with a budget, it might uh, reflect on the technical specification. You might want to go back and modify that. Now, I deliberately relegated item number four, construction approach, to fourth place. And that's for a very good reason, because we probably would naturally start here. But I think it's worth um, waiting until you've firmly established why you want to undertake this project, what the overall technical specification is, and um, some idea of how much you are going to spend on this or how much you're going to spend per month. Now, within um, uh, the range of possibilities, there are two broad categories, those who have a well-equipped machine shop and those who are limited to basic hand tools or a very limited workshop. And for those who have a well-equipped machine shop, well, um, of course, most of it could be made in-house, but it still might be a viable option to have some parts made outside for various reasons. Uh, those two possibilities also apply, believe it or not, to having a basic workshop. There are a number of good examples on the net of people who have made lathes using basically hand tools, and um, so that's a viable possibility. And of course, having machined parts, having parts machined outside is, is definitely um, a, a way to achieve your, your aims. Now, there's a third option there, and that is to borrow someone else's equipment. And uh, in some parts of the world and in some situations, that is definitely a possibility. Now, um, across the spectrum, uh, buying in bought parts, um, I put there significant bought parts. I'm not just talking about nuts and bolts but I'm talking about uh, major parts of the construction, uh, that is a possibility. And there are a number of examples of that too on the net. So through those means, um, you can come up with a construction strategy for your project. Now, on the other side of the chart, um, of course, uh, buying in significant board parts is, is part of, it could be part of your strategy. Um, but on the right-hand side with the, um, parts machined outside, uh, there are two possibilities. One, that you complete each of those items so they're ready to assemble on the machine. But there is another option, which in fact I adopted often, which was to have parts uh, machined um, with their critical surfaces or the difficult parts and leaving the rest to do myself at home in my own workshop, fitting if you like, or finishing. And uh, that was a good approach. Now, once you've looked at your construction uh, approach, you can then go back and look at your technical specification, ask the question, does it need to be amended? And similarly with your budget, it could be that, and you look at the details, you realize this is too expensive, or it could be that you, des you decide, well, actually I can make a bigger machine or a machine with a better specification. Now, there are a number of um, good examples of approaches, and the first that I have um, selected uh, um, is Joe Pye's uh, manufacture of a miniature lathe. And uh, because he has a very good workshop, uh, well equipped, he made all of this in house. And a very interesting video or series of videos, I recommend you have a look at it. That's a good example of this uh, kind of construction approach. The second example I want to uh, present is actually the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, using limited uh, uh, tools and making everything at home. And uh, this comes from ClickSpring, uh, an excellent series of videos. Uh, have a look at ClickSpring, his channel, 
and in particular the series on producing Antikythera, a calculating machine from the first century BC from Greece. And uh, he um, looks at uh, how this was made. Uh, whilst it's not a lathe project, the principles are, are very interesting and I think give a good example of how and what you can do with very limited equipment. Now, there are other approaches. Um, there is um, this approach here uh, from let's, let's Learn Something. And uh, um, uh, in this channel, the maker uh, produces um, a whole range of um, uh, equipment, including a lathe and a milling machine. And um, this approach uh, includes significant bought-in parts. In fact, you can see in this picture here, you can see that uh, linear bearings are used for the bedways and for the cross slide uh, and uh, bought in um, screw threads as well and bearing housings. And uh, um, that's a viable approach, that's a good approach and um, it's just an alternative way. So have a look at that channel too. On a similar vein, um, homemade madness. Uh, this is a, a great machine uh, produced um, uh, from uh, heavy uh, um, steel sections, uh, welded up construction. Um, uh, considerable skill I think is shown in this and some quite novel approaches to producing the bedways. Uh, and uh, significant boarding parts are used here too, um, particularly here the headstock bearings which are in view. So um, this is another good example of a combination of making in-house, but with significant bought in parts. Take a look at that channel too. I'd like to just uh, also include my own construction approach for my previous three videos on making a homemade lathe, which was really a combination of um, several um, approaches on the right-hand side of the drawing, making many parts uh, in-house, in fact as many as I could reasonably, but also having some parts machined and borrowing other people's equipment. Now the interesting thing is as the lathe developed, this is probably other people's experience too, you tend to move from the right hand side of the chart to the left hand side because then you have a machine that you can use in-house and so more and more you can produce your own items. And that is very satisfying. And I think that that is a major part of the fun for me in making my own machine. Now, timescale, yeah, that's an important topic. Um, again, you might think, well, why are we talking about money and time? This, is, uh, this may be just a hobby for me, um, not a business, but time is important. And the reason I, I believe this is because um, quite a number of projects uh, uh, don't reach completion. People sell on part uh, finished models, for example, or equipment, uh, or it gets scrapped. And uh, a lot of work has gone into something which never is completed. And I think part of the problem has been that not enough thought has gone into timescale. So if you're going to think about timescale, you need to take into account why, uh, uh, the budget, and the construction approach. You need to think about all those aspects. And if it's a fast project, well, it could be a holiday project, it could be a business need, and it could be something that you have a very um, fixed time scale for. It could be sl slow, a long-term hobby, um, and it could be something where um, this goes on for uh, many years. But how much time can you spend on this per month? That, that might be a helpful way of looking at it. Uh, how much time should you spend on it? Uh, that's also a good question. Um, we don't want to become, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, sort of hermits in our workshops. I think we need to maintain a balance between our interests uh, and uh, the rest of our lives. So let's maintain that balance. And uh, budget, well, um, we look at the time scale, you might think, okay, I need to maybe put some more money into this and buy more parts or construction approach. Maybe I need to uh, have more parts machined from outside, or maybe I can afford to spend more time on this and build more myself. Now, lifestyle, that's a, a, a strange consideration perhaps for some, but um, it, is, it is a consideration. Are you settled in one location? If you are, congratulations, because for most of my 
uh, my time um, when I've had a workshop, I've been separated from it uh, because of work. Um, you, you might have a mobile existence because you're a student or uh, you have to move because of your work or you live in rented accommodation. These are all factors which affect the kind of project you can undertake. Consider the physical size of your project and the time scale. And this is going to feed into the technical specification. And I think it's going to feed into the construction approach and the time scale. Now, another question to ask, um, which may not be immediately obvious is, should you undertake this project on your own or in partnership with someone else? It might make an impractical project possible. Uh, but if you do go down that route, how are you going to divide the work and who's going to own the product? Where are you going to locate it? Who's going to have access to it on completion? Uh, this might affect the technical specification. Maybe you can up it by doing this in partnership with someone. Uh, maybe you can up the budget and have a much more ambitious project. Uh, your construction approach might you might open up new avenues because of the capability uh, of uh, or the skills of your colleague. And timescale, it might make uh, making this a lot quicker. Spin-offs, um, these are things which uh, perhaps you hadn't originally uh, anticipated, but are benefits that might come out of a project like this. Now, uh, for me, um, health and well-being, that, that was a consideration. I did need something uh, where I could uh, relax and unwind and uh, spend a little time on my own. And uh, this activity, this project was definitely helpful in that respect. It could also be that it's a great way to connect with other people. Um, there could be a social side to this and uh, it could be that uh, getting parts made in other places uh, takes you out and about. What can I learn? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you can learn a huge amount. And so uh, that's definitely a spin off. And what can I pass on to someone else? That's a real consideration. Perhaps in doing this project, you can um, allow someone else to tag along and learn something and uh, pass on some experience to someone else. And that's going to feed back into the why. Perhaps as you think about this, it might slightly modify the reason for undertaking this project. And also the construction approach. Maybe uh, there's something about a spin-off there which affects the way you want to make this product. Assets in your local environment. Are there any particular opportunities where you live which might influence the way you go about this project? Perhaps um, there is a workshop near you. Perhaps you have a colleague who has equipment. Perhaps um, there's a certain process where you live which is um, cheap and easy and you can get access to it. Uh, perhaps uh, labor is cheap where you live. Perhaps materials are cheap. There are a number of factors here which could influence the way you go about the project. So materials, suppliers, cost of labor versus materials. These are all going to have an impact on your construction approach. And that's what makes this interesting because it means that the way you tackle this project is going to be very different from the way that I or someone else is going to. Now, number 10 is, this is interesting and I, I can thoroughly recommend this too. What have others already done? Uh, why bury your head in the sand? Why not um, go on YouTube, have a look around, see what others have done learn from them. Uh, we can always learn from other people. What possibilities are there? Well, uh, when we see what others have done, we suddenly realize, ah, there's another way of doing this. Equally, what pitfalls are there? Uh, maybe we can learn from someone else's mistakes. Uh, maybe it can stop us from going down a dead end. And, and lastly, and this is really important, inspiration. I think nine tenths of what we do is insp requires inspiration. It's it's that spark, it's that drive, it's that um, that sense of uh, moving forward. And when we see what others have done successfully, it may inspire us to get going and undertake a project like this. That's going to have an influence on your construction approach, and it may well affect uh, the why of this project. So look at what others have done. Now, as we look at uh, a summary of what we've uh, looked at today, 
uh, we, we see that there are 10 interdependent uh, factors which we need to take seriously before we get too far into our design work. And uh, these are going to help you enormously, uh, not saying that they're going to be written in stone and can't be changed, but they give you a starting point for your project. So, uh, of course, what we really want to do is get onto the construction approach. So in the next video, we're going to be focusing on that. And I hope that uh, that will uh, take us forward and uh, it will give us an opportunity to consider um, some more detailed aspects of designing and making your own homemade lathe. Come up close to the pumping station here and there's a plaque up here on the wall which uh, tells us that within one year of this uh, railway opening, it was closed in 1848. And that was due to high operating costs and uh, other technical diff difficulties. Uh, but the whole point of this video is planning is important. And uh, I just suggest to you that before you start your uh, workshop project, take a little time to plan it and think ahead.